a lot of workplaces have at least one weird rule that its employees have to follow. Everyone is familiar with McDonald's. The Golden Arches, the Big Mac, the Happy Meals. Californian Taco Bell workers can't buy discounted food on their lunch break and then go outside. They're the stuff of fond childhood memories and guilty pleasures well into adulthood. In 2010, Australian Starbucks baristas weren't allowed to move from the espresso counter if that was their station. Heck, there's even a Reddit thread that asks the question, what's the most ridiculous rule in your place of work? And this post has over 28,000 comments. Another workforce that has to put up with its employer's strange directives is the White House kitchen staff. Because, let's be honest, sometimes, you just get a craving for a Big Mac and some fries, and there's absolutely nothing that can satisfy it but the real thing. Founded in 1940 by Richard and Maurice McDonald, otherwise known as Dick and Mac, it took an entrepreneur named Ray Kroc and a ton of drama to catapult McDonald's to the global fame they have today. According to McDonald's official history, Kroc bought out the brothers in 1961 for a cool $2.7 million, adjusted for inflation, that's about $23 million in today's money. That's a lot of money, but considering Statista says the McDonald's brand was worth over $126 billion in 2018, it's safe to say that was a good investment. So, we know McDonald's is massive, and we know you've been there dozens of times. But unfortunately for these folks, they have to endure a load of absurd guidelines. The chefs need to cater to the president's tummy, jump through security hoops, and occasionally follow fancy dinner etiquette. That's right, they have to tolerate more than two or three unusual rules like the rest of us. But, what don't you know about McDonald's? It probably doesn't surprise you that a company this big has a ton of weird stories they try to keep quiet, so this is the untold truth of McDonald's. McDonald's once recalled a million McNuggets while customers stateside might not have heard about it. McDonald's Japan had some major issues in 2014 and 2015, issues so big and so gross that Mother Jones reported they led to a 10% sales decline. It started in July 2014, when McDonald's stepped in to take some serious action against one of their chicken suppliers, Shanghai Husi Food Co. Rumor had it that the factory was mixing expired product in with the fresh stuff then shipping it to McDonald's, Starbucks, and Burger King in Japan and China, and that's just gross. Just a month later, a customer in Osaka found a piece of a human tooth in their fries, and it doesn't need to be said just how big a deal that was. Then, in early 2015, there were several reports of customers finding pieces of plastic and vinyl in their chicken McNuggets, leading the recall of one million of the bite-sized chicken chunks. Their supplier, Cargill, investigated, and came to the conclusion that the contamination didn't happen in their factory. So where did it come from? We may never know, who would have thought that an institution that was built in 1792 would be in any way archaic? So, let's put on our history helmets and sprint headfirst into the weird orders that the White House chefs must follow. But it was there. The McDonald's Big Mac isn't trademarked in Europe. Let's say you're opening a restaurant in New York, and you want to call one of your burgers the Big Mac. Just make sure that your strap is done up. How well do you think that would work out for you? Now, if you were to open it in Spain? You'd be fine. That's because McDonald's actually lost the trademark to the Big Mac in the European Union after a decision by the EU Intellectual Property Office via Reuters, and this is how it happened. The Guardian says that it was in the 1960s that Pat McDonough was given the nickname Supermac during a football match in Ireland's County Westmeath. Later, McDonough went on to open a massively successful burger chain, and he called it Supermax. When he tried to open locations outside of Ireland, McDonald's claimed Supermac was too close to Big Mac and would lead to brand confusion. But the EU IPO ruled in favor of Supermax, and it was a huge deal. It didn't just mean the Irish chain could expand into other countries in the EU, it also meant that the Big Mac trademark was void. And that's huge, especially considering the number of McClawsuits McDonald's has previously filed and won. They even prevented a dentist from opening a practice called McDental, and a Singapore coffee from getting the trademark M-A-C-C-O-F-F-E-E. -E. Now, a different precedent has been set. McDonald's is the world's biggest toy distributor. McDonald's isn't just about food, and if you have fond memories of opening your Happy Meal to see what toy you got, you're certainly not alone. A couple of these facts could hurt your head. All food has to be screened by White House chefs throughout the years. Many people have said that the president has official food tasters that check that their chow is safe. Happy Meals made their debut in 1979, and cost one dollar, and they've been a popular staple ever since. The fact-checking site Snopes declared that the claim, 
food tasters work on behalf of U.S. so popular, in fact, that The Motley Fool says that in 2004, they typically accounted for about 20% of sales, and that made McDonald's the largest toy distributor in the world. And that's incredibly valuable. Win the hearts of kids, and you not only get their parents' attention, but you have customers for life. Happy meals are changing with the times, too. In 2014, The Atlantic reported that because McDonald's UK ran a promotion that offered codes for e-books instead of toys, it made them, temporarily, at least, the largest book distributor in the UK. See, they can use their powers for good. Here's a fun fact. Yes, some of those McDonald's toys are worth a decent amount of money. According to Mental Floss, if you have the late 1990s era McFerbies, any of the early Diener Keshi figures from the late 1970s and early 1980s, any of the Monsters, Ink toys, or full sets of the Minions toys or the 101 Dalmatians, you can make a bit of extra cash. McDonald's is not the biggest fast food chain in the US. McDonald's is huge, and they're everywhere. But here's the really surprising thing. They're historically not the largest fast food chain in the world, not by a long shot. First, a bit of a disclaimer, it's hard to give exact numbers, because so many locations are opening and closing all the time. So let's talk about 2017. According to CNBC, McDonald's was only the second largest chain in the world, as far as physical locations go. Presidents, is true. The explanation then goes on to outline a bunch of sources that report on this phenomenon. Yet, on the other hand, a former White House chef named Walter Scheib told the Washingtonian that this position doesn't exist. He said, there is no presidential food taster. While Scheib did say that the food tasters are fictitious, he also admitted that there are security systems in place that aim to protect the president's meals. While they had 37,241 restaurants, they were handily beat out by Subway and their 43,912 locations. Starbucks was a surprisingly distant third, trailing with their 27,339 stores. But that's a bit deceptive. Nothing gets to the president that hasn't fallen under somebody's jurisdiction, commented Scheib. If the president is just grabbing a pretzel randomly at the table, it's been screened. It does make a lot of sense that every presidential food item gets evaluated. When it comes to sales growth, Starbucks and McDonald's were miles ahead. And now, let's talk about 2018 and stores in the US nevertheless, it's also a little otherworldly. Just imagine a chef going into work and legally not being allowed to offer their boss some tic tacs that they brought in from home. The executive White House chef's job is in the hands of the first lady. The White House executive chef is a kitchen staff member with an incredible number of responsibilities. Men's Journal stated, the executive chef is in charge of feeding the president and first family every day, catering to official guests at the White House from prime ministers to the egg-rolling masses, as well as all private functions for the president and the first lady. A layperson might imagine that the White House chooses who gets this central gig. Only. According to Business Insider, Subway was still at the top of the pile with around 25,800 domestic locations. But Starbucks had recently passed McDonald's, opening 14,300 stores in comparison to McDonald's roughly 14,000 U.S. restaurants. However, that's not the case. As Ms. Go figure, McDonald's doesn't make their money selling food at a glance, McDonald's makes and sells food. Magazine reported that, it is the duty of the First Lady to appoint the White House executive chef. The First Lady also has the power to fire an executive chef. In 2005, the Washington Post said, Laura Bush fired the White House executive chef in February. The person who was let go was White House chef Walter Scheib. So, that must be how they make their money, right? Not quite, says Quartz. They found that a large percentage of their profits comes not from Big Macs and fries, but from real estate. He told the New York Times in a phone interview that it was difficult to satisfy Bush's stylistic requirements. It's not unthinkably strange that the first lady hires the executive chef. Part of their franchising strategies involves buying the land the restaurant will be on then leasing the plot to the franchisee, and about 85% of McDonald's locations are run by franchisees. More than that, they often lease the properties at massive markups that mean even though the average McDonald's makes around $2. 7 million a year, the average take-home pay for a franchise owner is just $154,000 a year. 
After all, they'll probably be eating many a meal that they serve up. Around 22% of gross profits go into rent, and the numbers are staggering. As of 2016, McDonald's held about $30 billion worth of real estate, and that netted them an annual profit of $4.5 billion. Talk about a brilliant business plan. The cost of doing business for McDonald's is shocking if you've ever thought running a McDonald's franchise might be for you. Here's some pretty shocking, behind-the-scenes numbers that might make you think twice, starting with the fact that Business Insider reported that McDonald's requires each one of their new franchisees to have $750,000 in liquid assets available before they'll even consider you. Startup costs can range anywhere from $958,000 and $2.2 million, and includes everything from construction to kitchen equipment and signage. But it is wild that they can fire an employee at their discretion and at any time. If you were working in the White House, you'd probably want a little more job security. The White House pastry chef has to make a gingerbread house every year the White House doesn't just have an executive chef. Oh no, it also has a staff member who specializes in pastries. Susan Morrison, the current executive pastry chef, outlined her responsibilities to O, oh, the Oprah magazine back in 2016. Franchisees are responsible for paying 40% of that with non-borrowed cash, though they do allow you to borrow you the rest. Then, franchisees pay a $45,000 franchise fee, as well as 4% of gross sales every month, along with rent. She said, most of my day-to-day -day focus is on desserts for White House events. They're also responsible for any upgrades that need to be done to the restaurant to keep it in line with other McDonald's locations, and some of those fees are pretty shocking. I could be creating miniature pastries for a reception on the state floor or serving sweets for a luncheon in the West Wing. Our top priority, though, is always the first family. Morrison has an additional responsibility that's slightly more bizarre in nature. She has to build an impressive gingerbread house. I spend all year thinking about the White House gingerbread house, but we don't begin baking until November, Morrison said. Then, for about four days after Thanksgiving, we work tirelessly to build the house before moving it to the state dining room, where more than 60,000 guests will cycle through. And Morrison wasn't the only pastry chef who was required to make a sensational gingerbread house. A Create Your Taste kiosk will set you back $125,000, a McCafe espresso machine is a whopping $13,000, and upgrades to the interior can run up a bill as high as $600,000. And if they decide the whole restaurant needs a remodel, you're looking at as much as $2 million. Still interested? McDonald's based an ad campaign around a song about a murderer if you're of a certain age. You might remember McDonald's, Mac Tonight, campaign. The HuffPost claimed that a confectionery building is created every year. Mike even released an article called, From Nixon to Trump, A History of the White House Gingerbread Home. It appears that if a person wanted this dessert gig, then they'd have to follow the rules and bake up an annual sculpture. The president can cancel specific foods from the White House chef's repertoire John Moeller, a former White House chef, wrote in his memoir that he served at the pleasure of the president. This means that if the president wants to ban a specific food from going into his mouth hole, then it will probably become banned. This topic is discussed in a C-SPAN program that interviews former White House chefs. One of these ex-employees, Pierre Chambrin, states that George H. It's the one with the moon wearing super suave sunglasses, and singing about how McDee's was for dinner, not just lunch. W but here's the weird thing, the song they picked to parody was about a criminal and murderer. The song was Mac the Knife, made famous by 1950s star Bobby Darin. Bush didn't want broccoli or Brussels sprouts served to him. He remembers, I served him some Brussels sprouts. It's catchy, sure, but it's also a song based on a German song from the Threepenny Opera. And he told the butler, tell Pierre never to serve that to me again. That being said, it's worth noting that Bush didn't ban broccoli from the White House, he just didn't want to eat it himself. Mrs. Bush asks for broccoli sometimes, comments Chamberlain. While it makes sense that this etiquette exists, it's also a tad hilarious. Just imagine a restaurant patron finding a waiter, asking them to tell the head chef not to ever give them tomatoes for the next four years, and then expect the place to remember that request. The White House chefs are on call 24-7 A White House chef can't mute their mobile, or couldn't unplug their landline, in the old days, as they gently drift off to sleep. Well. They can, but they may end up in trouble if their employer calls them to come in to cook. Yup, 
When the president's in the building, the kitchen staff are on standby. Pastry chef Bill Yasses told HuffPost, in theory, we were working 24-7. However, while the president could technically tell a chef to whip up a 2 a.m. that was originally a pretty graphic, incredibly violent tale about a man named Macheath, who actually dates back to 1728, says the concourse. While McDonald's, Moon Man, sung lyrics like, when the clock strikes, half past six, babe, time to head for, golden lights, Darren had sung lyrics like, you know when that shark bites, with his teeth, babe, scarlet billows, start to spread. There are also entire verses about someone being drowned at the bottom of a river with a pair of cement shoes, and the ladies of the night lining up for Mac and, well, that's about as far from slinging burgers as you can get. The campaign disappeared abruptly, and that's largely because Darren's only son sued McDonald's for $10 million. Dish. Yasas was never required to make such a meal. I was there for eight years and that did not occur. He went on to say, there could be a national emergency and the people involved have to get up at 3 a.m. The internet never forgets, though, and the moon man went on to have a post-mainstream ad campaign life as a racist meme created by YTMND, a something awful 4chan spin-off group. McDonald's isn't welcome in a lot of countries there are a ton of McDonald's restaurants worldwide, but surprisingly, there are a number of cities and countries that don't have a single location, and handle a crisis. The crises happened, but they weren't hungry. Walter Scheib also stated that he wasn't frequently asked to cook food at unconventional hours. He informed Vice, we really didn't do much of the midnight snack thing. It seems as if the presidents that Scheib and Yasses served never really abused this power. It's fortunate that these chefs weren't treated like emergency room service dispensers. A state dinner has a bunch of full-on rules for White House chefs. White House state dinners sound like the fanciest of affairs. According to the White House Historical Association, they are put on to honor the head of a government or a reigning monarch. Take Florence. In 2016, The Telegraph was reporting on a lawsuit McDonald's had filed against the city after they refused to let the Golden Arches set up shop at the Piazza del Duomo. What other areas can't get their McDonald's fix? When the U.S. military closed their base in Bermuda in 1995, McDonald's closed, too, and they haven't reopened, because of the Prohibited Restaurants Act 1977. Iran kicked them out in 1979, and instead, they're home to a chain called McDonald's. Macedonia and McDonald's had a falling out, and McDonald's chose to cut and run out of Bolivia after a sort of nationwide disdain for the chain resulted in poor sales. Barbados, which traditionally doesn't eat much beef, was another failed experiment, with their McDonald's lasting just one year. There are plenty of rumors as to why McDonald's has never opened in Montenegro, and, of course, there are none in North Korea. But most fascinating of all is Iceland, who said goodbye to McDonald's in 2008. According to Culture Trip, love for an Icelandic burger chain called Hamburgarabula was so strong that the people boycotted McDonald's. Visitors can still stop and see the last McDonald's burger ever served, though, as it's sitting at the Reykjavik bus hostel, looking much the same as it did years ago. McDonald's made a massive move to ban straws if everyone did just one thing to help the environment, it would make a huge difference. Business Insider noted that hundreds of people can attend a single event. They also appear to be one of the most stressful banquets that a chef could ever cook for. In 2012, The Blade reported that some past and present White House chefs spoke at a panel hosted by the Association of Food Journalists. In 2018, one-time use plastics, particularly drinking straws, made headlines as people started to realize just how bad for the environment they are. This discussion illuminated a few intense state dinner rules. The Blade wrote, second portions are never offered, but will be served if a guest requests them. Moreover, the article noted, from the moment the first course is placed on the table to the moment the last course is served, no more than 55 minutes may elapse. And each course must absolutely be ready to be served at the proper time, no delays will be tolerated. Not only are these requirements sweat-inducing, they're also oddly specific. According to Ocean Collective, via CNBC, they're one of the items most commonly found during beach cleanups, and the problem with getting rid of them is that alternatives are much more expensive. But McDonald's has still vowed to ditch straws, starting with their restaurants in the UK and Ireland. According to The Independent, all 1,361 locations will have their plastic straws replaced by paper ones, at a much greater cost to the Golden Arches. 
but both government officials and customers have lauded the decision, and not a moment too soon. UN estimates suggest that unless something major is done, by 2050 the seas will contain more plastics than fish, and that's terrible. For instance, why is it that the last course is required to be served in less than 55 minutes from the beginning of the meal? Why not an hour? Who in the world came up with that number? These directives seem hoity-toity and like they were made to make the chef's lives more difficult. Sometimes White House chefs have to cook gobs of hard-boiled eggs every Easter. The White House hosts its annual egg roll. Thanks, McDonald's. McDonald's accidentally designed golden arches aren't always gold today. McDonald's golden arches are among the most recognizable logos in the world, but they came about pretty accidentally. And if you're wondering what this event entails, you're probably not alone. Luckily, a writer named Max Bonham decided to break this tradition down. According to BBC, the McDonald brothers met with LA-based architect Stanley Clark Meston to come up with a distinctive design for their buildings. On top of the flat-roofed building they had drawn up, Richard McDonald added two giant half-circles that were meant to catch the eye of passers-by, all potential customers. Meston turned those into the M, we all know and love today, and the very first ones were installed along with the very first franchised restaurant, opened in Phoenix, Arizona in 1953. It went through a few more tweaks, and here's the weird thing, they're not all golden. When McDonald's opened their location in Sedona, Arizona, they had to conform to local laws that served to protect the look and feel of the landscape, so their M is turquoise. There are similar laws in place in other areas, which means the M in Monterey, California is black, and those in Bruges and on the Champs-Élysées in Paris are white. And here's a weird, fun fact you'll never be able to unknow. Freudian psychologists have suggested it's such a popular logo because it's reminiscent of humankind's original source of nourishment, breasts. McDonald's had the long-running legal case in English history McDonald's is one of the parties involved in England's longest-running legal case in history, and it's just as much of a saga as you'd expect. In a nutshell, in 1986, London Greenpeace released a pamphlet called, What's Wrong with McDonald's? Everything They Don't Want You to Know. There were all kind of accusations in it, from the mistreatment of animals to encouraging litter. In a food and wine article, he said, the White House egg roll is an annual race where kids push eggs through the grass of the White House's lawn with long-handled spoons. This shindig can additionally feature a classic Easter egg hunt and a bundle of other activities. The White House's event also features a mind-boggling number of hard-boiled eggs. In 1990, McDonald's filed their libel suit against five people. Three apologized, but Helen Steele, a part-time bar worker, and David Morris, an unemployed postal worker, both pictured, headed to court. The pair got next to no help, and when they appealed to the European Court of Human Rights for legal aid against the millions McDonald's was throwing at them, they were essentially told they were doing well enough on their own. Bonham stated, over 14,000 hard-boiled eggs are hand-dyed for use in the egg roll and the hunt. The White House kitchen staff are sometimes required to hard boil and dye a ton, it not all, of these eggs. BBC says it wasn't until 1994 that the full trial got into motion, and spawned around 60,000 pages of documents. It wasn't over until June 19, 1997, when the judge issued his 762-page verdict and ordered Steele and Morris to pay £60,000 in damages, finding McDonald's not guilty of many of their accusations. The pair have refused to pay, McDonald's has said they have no interest in collecting, and the case went down in history. Your McDonald's chicken McNuggets may have died of heart failure not everyone loves McDonald's, especially animal rights activists. The chain's official stance says, we believe treating animals with care and respect is an integral part of our commitment to serving McDonald's customers safe food, and that's admirable. But animal rights groups say they're not following through on their commitments. In 2018, Animal Equality partnered with other organizations to demonstrate at McDonald's locations and to broadcast iAnimal, a VR experience that took people, inside, factory farms to see the suffering of the chickens that ultimately made it onto McDonald's menu. They called out McDonald's not just for their policies, via PR Newswire, but for not being the leader in animal welfare they thought they should be. According to The Independent, one of the core issues was unnatural breeding practices that resulted in chickens that got too big too quickly and ended up suffering all kinds of health issues and heart failure. 
In 1998, the Los Angeles Times reported that these folks colored 7,200 shells for the celebration. Furthermore, The Atlantic showcased some photos of the 2001 team preparing these items. In the first pic, the chef assistants are working while a tower of egg boxes looms in the background. In the second snap, two employees are lifting a slew of them. It's a little uncanny that this facility is sometimes required to cook heaps of eggs that will hopefully never be eaten. All this came on the heels of McDonald's announcement, via Reuters, that they were going to be raising the standard of care for their chickens. Needless to say, most kitchen workers don't have to annually boil food for a children's lawn game. White House chefs can be ordered to make unusual meals when the White House kitchen is cooking for the president, the staff members are probably going to give their boss something he wants to eat. By 2024, this means that if the president is craving a peculiar meal, then his staff should be finding a way to make it, even if it's something somewhat strange. Back in 1969, the Reading Eagle reported that Richard Nixon liked eating cottage cheese that was covered in ketchup. Is it good enough? You shouldn't go through the drive through on horseback at McDonald's ever wonder if you could go through the drive through and satisfy your craving for a McFlurry while you're, say, riding a horse. If you haven't wondered, have you even really lived? There's a surprising number of people who have not only tried, but who have made headlines for it. The newspaper wrote, Nixon talked about his dish during an appearance at the White House Conference on Food, Nutrition and Health. He says he feels he should eat cottage cheese for diet and health reasons, but doesn't like the taste. So he covers it with ketchup, which he does like. In a C-SPAN interview, host Susan Stamberg asks the former White House chefs if they'd cook this meal for Nixon. In March 2018, BBC reported that a man in Suffolk, England had trotted up to the drive through and attempted to order a McCafe latte before being told the drive through actually wasn't for horses. He went inside to get his coffee. Just a few months later it happened again, in Worcestershire. She says, I wonder how you would have reacted when day after day the request from him came, I'll have cottage cheese with ketchup. Frank Ruda, who'd worked in the kitchen for 11 years, shrugs his shoulders. It's as if he's expressing that he doesn't understand that flavor combination, but he'd still make it for the president. The customer wanted a Big Mac, and the horse. His name was Oliver, Express reported. Unusual meals like this one highlight how atypical a White House kitchen job is. Not many restaurants would instruct a chef to make such a dish. The executive White House chef receives no overtime pay being an executive chef at the White House is a lot of hard work. They're planning state dinners, they're potentially working strange hours, and they're cooking for the president. However, while these responsibilities seem rather demanding, this position receives no overtime pay whatsoever. The New York Times laid out this fact in a story that they published in 2005. They weren't served by McDonald's, but they did get a snack from a nearby Cafe Nero. South Carolina's Isaiah Rones had better luck, when the AJC caught him on camera going through the drive through for some sweet tea and apple pies, and yes, his trusty steed was the recipient of an apple-flavored treat, too. But a McDonald's in New Zealand wasn't having any of it, when they turned away two women on horseback. The newspaper said, the pay, $80,000 to $100,000 a year with no overtime, for what is essentially a private family chef who occasionally has an opportunity to show off at a state dinner, is well below what top-level chefs can earn on the outside. It is truly baffling that White House executive chefs aren't allowed to obtain overtime payments. According to Wide Open Pets, the chain cited health and safety reasons for turning riders away. McDonald's isn't McLovin Ronald McDonald anymore for decades, Ronald McDonald has been the face of McDonald's, but in recent years. The fact that they could be asked to make up a plate at any time and would not be compensated if they did work extra hours makes their workplace sound astoundingly stingy. A president can even direct their White House chefs to brew beer if you were a White House chef, you'd probably think that your responsibilities would essentially be limited to cooking. But this assumption would be incorrect. Not so much, and it turns out that people have been calling for his head for a long time. According to The Street, there was a major push back in 2011 to retire him. Why? Because, petitions said, he was being used to market unhealthy fast food items to kids, and that wasn't good. For instance, the president could even ask you to make them some beer from scratch. The first president to tell his kitchen staff to brew some beer was Barack Obama. At the time, CBR says he was sort of already on his way out, 
McDonald's was shifting their marketing more toward adults, and had already gotten rid of most of their other McDonaldland characters. His White House even released a 2012 video that explains why it was created. Still, Ronald was being increasingly more often lumped in with mascots like Joe Camel, who represented a company now condemned for trying to make cigarettes appeal to the youth. And nowhere was that more visible than their ill-fated attempt to give Ronald his own Twitter account. In this clip, assistant chef Sam Cass says, brewing beer is becoming a thing that Americans are doing in their homes and garages across the country. Forbes says that when the chain decided to have their mascot tweet with hashtag Ronald McDonald in 2014, it went about as well as expected. There was more hate than love, and his fate was finally sealed in 2016. He was officially retired when the world started seeing people dressed as creepy, threatening clowns everywhere, and that was when McDonald's decided enough was enough. Today, he only makes the occasional appearance like at the Thanksgiving Day Parade, via the New York Post, and, of course, at the Ronald McDonald House Charities. And the president certainly thought it would be a good idea to see if we could join the American people in that time-honored tradition and brew some of our own beer. This recording then goes on to outline how these beverages are created. Even though the kitchen staff seems genuinely enthusiastic about making this product, it's a bit silly that Obama can direct them to create a brew. Beer isn't a meal, nor is it an item that chefs typically make. The White House chefs need the highest level of security clearance it goes without saying that the United States Secret Service doesn't want the president's food to be poisoned. Because that chain of events wouldn't be ideal. But it also appears as if this organization doesn't want to be a hawk in the White House kitchen. Therefore, in order to allow the president to eat, they give the chefs a special title that authorizes them to cook for the president. Walter Scheib actually mentioned this to Vice, the clearance that you have when you're working in the White House is called top secret presidential proximity. He also asserted, obviously, this is one of the most security cleared posts you can get. In terms of the few of us that are in the kitchen who have that clearance, if you think about it, we're not just around outside and next to the president, we're physically inside of him. You really couldn't get any more close to that. Not many chefs in the world can say that they need, Top secret presidential proximity, clearance just to make a meal. The White House kitchen staff can't comment on the executive chef hiring process in 2005. The New York Times wrote another piece about the White House culinary world. It reported that the establishment's assistant chef Christetta Comerford would potentially become their executive chef. However, while Comerford was up for this position, she couldn't comment on how her employer chooses the person they want for the job. The publication stated, the candidates have been asked to keep mum about the selection process, and they are aware that the wrong word may remove them from consideration. As a White House employee, Ms. Comerford, 41, has refused to provide anything beyond the culinary world's equivalent of name, rank, and serial number. You know the rules of the house, she said in a quiet but firm voice. Since the New York Times published this story, Comerford became the executive chef. She has also conducted interviews with Vogue, CNN, and Asia Society discussing her various responsibilities. Considering that Comerford's been able to openly discuss some of her experiences in the White House kitchen, it's interesting that she wasn't allowed to comment on the selection process.